you look around the internet, you'll find no shortage of articles or videos offering to explain for us the endings of films that are not confusing, often with obnoxiously condescending titles such as, we finally understand what happened at the end of Iron Man, which I dare say most of us understood when we got to the end of Iron Man. With all this explanation being offered, there's a serious dearth of attempts at explaining films that could actually use it, such as David Lynch's three-hour opus, Inland Empire. Cowards. Well, as Iron Man's greatest nemesis once put it, fine, I'll do it myself. Inland Empire is a tricky film, even by the standards of David Lynch. It was shot in an unconventional manner, with Lynch using a standard definition Sony Handycam and working without a completed script. On this particular film, I would get an idea, write it down, and then go shoot it. However, I reject wholeheartedly the idea that it's a plotless collection of scenes leading nowhere, as some have suggested. There is an answer, and I know it. When will you tell it? Starting right now. No, seriously, I swear. Lynch films often have a key scene or clue that tells us something vital. For Lost Highway, it was... I like to remember things my own way. For Mulholland Drive, it was... I just came here from Deep River, Ontario, and now I'm in this... dream place. Inland Empire actually has a few key points to notice, such as... Hollywood, California, where stars make dreams, and dreams make stars. A line which is highlighted by the fact that Lynch got William H. Macy to deliver it in his only shot in the entire film. There's also this brief and abrupt flashback wherein Laura Dern's character denies speaking Polish, which seems to annoy her husband. I think she understands more than she lets on. But I don't speak it. And of course, there's his primary filmic influence. If Wild at Heart was Lynch's take on The Wizard of Oz and Lost Highway was his take on Double Indemnity, then Inland Empire is indisputably his take on Billy Wilder's Sunset Boulevard, the story of fading star Norma Desmond and her addiction to fame. Have they forgotten what a star looks like? I'll show them. I'll be up there again, so help me. By that, I don't mean that the film is anything akin to a remake. I wouldn't do a remake. But its direct influence is inarguable. This is a film which Lynch has referenced previously, both in Mulholland Drive, where Norma Desmond's car makes a guest appearance, and in Twin Peaks, where Lynch's character of Gordon Cole is named for a minor character in Sunset Boulevard, which Dale Cooper is actually watching in season three when he finally starts to recover his memory. Get Gordon Cole. The deliberate intertwining of the two films is something I will explain as we go. To best understand this most intricate of films, it's best to start near the beginning. The very first scene is of a record being cut, as we hear that we are listening to... Axon and the longest running radio play in history. Which suggests that the entire story may be one being told in this fictional radio broadcast. But for the purpose of explanation, I'll treat the story points as if they're meant to be taken as actually happening. This is difficult, because Inland Empire is like a Russian doll of stories nested inside other stories, the topmost one presumably being the aforementioned radio play. To unravel a structure inside, it's best to begin with this scene, which starts around 10 minutes in, and one of the only parts of the film that I can consider to be real, at least real in the context of the story. An old Polish woman drops by the home of her neighbor, actress Nikki Grace, explaining that she is new to the neighborhood and asking increasingly probing questions. Nikki lives in a palatial home, not unlike Norma Desmond, and is also no longer at the top of her game. Her newest director, Kingsley Stewart, will later tell her, You have everything you need to soar back to the top. 
and stay perched there. The Polish visitor spends most of the introduction making odd pronouncements and asking questions to which she already knows the answers, seeming to test Nikki's knowledge of what she's involved herself in by seeking this role. This is probably the most important scene in the film, as everything she says will come to bear. She tells Nikki that she has scored the part. I definitely heard that you have it. She asks if the story involves the subjects of marriage and murder and strenuously insists on that second point when Nikki denies it. She asks if Nikki's husband is involved and seems to doubt or distrust the negative answer she receives. She tells the beginnings of two short tales, one of a boy venturing into the world and inadvertently causing an evil reflection which follows him, and one she calls a variation of a little girl who becomes lost in an alley behind a marketplace, introducing the idea of multiple versions of the same story. Crucially, her last statement begins with the word if. If it was tomorrow, you would be sitting over there. The bulk of the film that follows is the old woman's tale, a hypothetical of what will happen if Nikki participates in the film. At the very end, we come back to this pair still sitting where they were at the start. The woman tells Nikki, I can't seem to remember if it's today two days from now or yesterday. <laughs> Indicating her story will be told out of order. She warns, Actions do have consequences. Which will be true on multiple levels and implies Nikki owes on an unpaid debt. As the story of Nikki's possible future begins, it's the next day and her agent calls to tell her the good news. She has snagged this dream role. Watching from the staircase, her husband Piotrek, also Polish, overhears and does not seem to be pleased. As the film moves into production, Nikki learns her co-star Devin Burke is a notorious womanizer, while Devin learns Nikki's husband is a well-connected man and not to be trifled with. After a dinner at Nikki's house, Beatrix takes Devin aside and suddenly warns him in so many words, Keep your goddamn hands off my wife! Adding that, There are consequences to one's actions, and there would, for certain, be consequences to wrong actions. Harkening back to what the old Polish woman said to Nikki, and speaking of her, her character likely makes a veiled reappearance in the story at around this point, as the film director is talking off screen while Nikki's makeup is applied about an unknown someone's 90-year-old niece, someone who is asking in that ancient foreign voice of hers insisting on knowing who is playing the character of Smithy. This is a character whose identity Lynch tap dances around, much as he did with Billy in the third season of Twin Peaks. I am going to find out one day. Earlier, we saw the facade of the Seth for Smithy's house on one of the sound stages. Smithy's house. However, no character is ever directly addressed by that name. Even in the credits, we only get a credit for Smithy's son, which essentially demands that Smithy be this guy. We'll get into that later. This scene of the two leads' first day on set is where the plot's primary motor is revealed. They are told by the director that On High and Blue Tomorrows is in fact a remake that was never completed after the two leads were murdered. That film, a German production called Wir Sieben, was itself not the origin of the story either. It was based on a Polish gypsy folk tale. The title in German was Wir Sieben, 4 7. And it was said to be cursed. This revelation comes after a stranger appears on set, only to vanish in the dead end behind the Smithy House facade when Devon goes to investigate. We will later see this scene repeat from the intruder's point of view when we find out it is Nikki herself, having merged with her character of Susan Blue and finding that instead of a mere facade, Smithy's house has become an actual home sitting somewhere in a neighborhood. Nikki has become the character she is playing. She now exists inside the film, and we are in another nested story. This is another allusion to Sunset Boulevard, where Norma Desmond has has written a script for herself wherein she would play Salome, the daughter of Herod who lusted for John the Baptist. He rejects her, so she demands his head on a golden tray. Norma also kills the man who rejects her. Sorry for the spoiler, but this film is 70 years old, so it's not my fault if you haven't gotten around to it yet. She becomes lost in her character just as Nikki will from this point forward. A man lives in this house, presumably Smithy, and aside from his hairstyle, he is a dead ringer for Piatrek. It is, in fact, the same actor. I'm a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude. Let's take a step back. Nowhere in Inland Empire does anyone use the word reincarnation, but the concept hangs over the whole film, with characters appearing to have lived multiple lives. This is the street. 
Lynch uses the metaphor of remakes and retold stories to illustrate the idea of a life lived more than once, with some aspects the same, some changed around, stories with variations. After hearing the film had its roots in an old Polish gypsy folktale, Nikki goes into a reverie, remembering a time when a Polish couple, possibly relatives of her husband's, were visiting and assumed that she could also speak Polish. Beatrix seems to expect her to be able to speak it. She politely but firmly insists that she does not. At this point in the story, he seems to recall to some degree his past life as Smithy, somewhat illuminating his apparent displeasure at Nikki getting the part in On High and Blue Tomorrows, the part of the unfaithful wife. In fact, we later do? see that the part of Smithy, as he appeared in the original film, is also played by the same actor with period-appropriate facial hair. It's my opinion that while Grace Abriski was only 65 when she played the role and hardly 90 years old, which was probably just hyperbole on Kingsley's part. Does what? this remind you of when you used to hunt Mastodon? Her character is is the elderly niece mentioned by Kingsley who expressed such an interest in the part of Smithy. She is likely the niece of someone involved with the original production of Veer Sieben, possibly the original Smithy himself, explaining her skepticism when Nikki denies her doppelganger of a husband is involved in the film. When Nikki and Devon begin an affair, following in the footsteps of their screen selves, Nikki describes an unexpected rush of strange memories she experienced during the filming of a scene the day before. Or was it? It's a story that happened yesterday. But I know it's tomorrow. The consummation of this affair occurs notably in the bedroom set of Smithy's house, where a silent Piatrag discovers their indiscretion. Even more significantly, Devon begins to refer to Nikki by her character's name. Sue, so damn. A little girl went out to play, lost in the marketplace. What's that scene that we did yesterday when I'm getting groceries for you with your car? Not through the marketplace, you see that, don't you? But through the alley, behind the marketplace. This is the way to the palace. When Nikki unexpectedly appears in the back of the studio and sees her husband watching her from a hiding place inside the set, she begins to do the same. Billy! Within the world of the film, she sees Smithy going to bed after shedding the same green coat her husband was wearing and the same bed where she and Devon slept together, identical to Piatrek but for his messy hair. In another room, marked by a red lamp, she finds a group of strange women. One might almost call it a red light district. They imply they know her, and under their encouragement, she begins to have visions of another life, a snowy street in a foreign city, a foreboding alleyway. But it isn't something. A vision of a young girl tells her to burn a hole in silk using a cigarette and to peer through the hole if she wishes to see. When she does this, Nikki, now Susan Blue, can see into the past, to the events of the original production. Are we meant to be seeing the film Veer Sieben itself or the actual events surrounding it? I suggest it doesn't matter as the two seem to be one and the same, in the past and in the present. It is the curse of this film that life imitates art. Despite the warnings and assurances that nothing would happen. She's a nice girl. She's so far from my style. Well, it's not even funny. Nikki and Devon begin having an actual affair just as their characters are doing the same, with Nikki at one point actually forgetting she's merely acting a scene. Damn! <laughs> this sounds like dialogue from our script. Susan Blue also receives a visit from a mysterious stranger who talks to her about an unpaid bill, again showing how the events in Nikki's life were already paralleling those of the script. And at the bottom of a series of stories so deeply nested it would make Inception jealous, we reach the earliest point of the tale that this film will explore. A man we will come to know as the Phantom and his wife, known in the credits only as Lost Girl, are having an argument which escalates into violence. Elsewhere in town, Smithy and his partner are also parting ways, with her vowing that she will never let him have her. Lost Girl and Smithy are having an affair which will not end well. Smithy's partner is, in this version of the story, his co-star. Though we don't see her face in this scene, we have seen it earlier, when this woman was telling a detective that she had been hypnotized to kill someone with a screwdriver, only to find it stuck in her own side. She believes he is leaving her because she cannot bear children. In Kingsley's remake, the roles will be moved around. The variation. Sue tells him she's pregnant, which he doesn't take well. He will later reveal, I can't father children. This makes Sue's admission of her pregnancy an inadvertent confession to adultery. Like the Phantom in the older story, he lashes out violently. Sue will be seen sitting around her home with her friends who lament his departure. He was the one. I really thought he was. In Veer Sieben, Lost Girl ends up on the street. Carrying a screwdriver for protection, she enters an abandoned building, after which a scream is heard. 
Dallas girl is afterwards seen collapsing to the ground. Inside the building, another woman lies dead. Who is she? She is one of the two leads, killed in what seems to have been self-defense when she tried to take revenge on Smithy's new love interest. She's been stabbed in the side with a screwdriver, something her later incarnation will remember. Brutal fucking murder. That later incarnation is Billy's wife, Doris, who discovers Sue's affair with her husband when she shows up at the house and clearly doesn't expect Doris to be home. I thought you were gone. Looking at Sue, Doris remembers who she was hypnotized to kill with a screwdriver, as well as remembering her previous life, when she herself was killed the same way, and over the same issue, her cheating partner's other woman. But I've put this introduction off for far too long. My name is Jack Rabbit. No, really. And me and my friends are what was found to be... Inside the story. Why are we rabbits? I could toss out a number of old world superstitions about rabbits as trickster spirits and witches familiars. <laughs> But in the end, you'd just have to ask David Lynch, who'd probably just say, We have to come to our own conclusion. Fuck, that's a good carrot. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, let's just skip over the why. You just go. You just go until it feels, it, until it feels right. We are a presence that exists within this film and who manipulate events within it. We're first seen right near the start of the movie, following an event for which you now have context. Lost Girl takes a man to a hotel and sleeps with him, after which she's seen alone in the bed crying as she watches the TV. This is where her path has led her. After her husband threw her out, she's forced into prostitution to survive. This room becomes her own personal purgatory, allowing her to see what happened on the TV and to see us, but not to leave. After her introduction, her nemesis enters the picture, seeking us out. I slipped on my convenient human disguise and met with the Phantom, who sought a way back into the story. He's still burned from being cheated on and wanted to visit the curse on his wife's new incarnation. It couldn't have pleased him that her new incarnation was married to the new incarnation of the man she left him for. We'll come back to that. It's around this point that one of us became personally involved in the story. Shortly after Sue burns through the silk with a cigarette, this burning hole appeared in our living room. And what do we know about these sorts of holes from our old Old friend Tyler Durden. In the industry, we call them cigarette burns. With Sue becoming more aware of the story she's in, one of our rank needed to intervene. This rabbit is summoned and sent to a place where she will soon take refuge, though, like with the Phantom, she will see him as a regular human as well. It's called a changeover. Sue actually doesn't seek help from this man until very late in the story, but Lynch's clever flash-forward technique allows us to dip in and out of their exchange over a very long stretch of time, rather than having what would amount to being a very long monologue suddenly slowing down the film to a crawl in its final act. Interspersed with her descriptions of her life and where it's led her, we see flashbacks of her life as Smithy before her affair was revealed. During a backyard barbecue, we learn several things. Sue is beginning to suspect she had a prior life. Look at me. And tell me if you've known me before. We will hear this exchange again with Lost Girl speaking to these same two women and her version of the story. Forgetfulness. It happens to us all. In this version, her husband had been a circus worker taking care of the animals at a circus where the Phantom had also performed a hypnotism act. Two of his old carny friends sent some impending danger and depart. We'll later learn that the Phantom, whose real name is Crimp, lives right next door. And finally, Sue is transfixed when her husband accidentally hoses his shirt with ketchup. It seems to remind her of something, perhaps something from a past life because... It was red. Exactly, and it's here that the film makes clear beyond any doubt its source of inspiration. Is it straight up nicks a scene from Sunset Boulevard, with the same dialogue appearing as on-screen titles. In both films, it represents an older film featuring the faded star at the story's center, albeit in different contexts. If this film depicts life imitating art, it itself is a case of art imitating life. And this is where we go way down, I hesitate to use a phrase as trite and cliched as rabbit hole, but well, here we are. The scenes meant to represent an old film of Norma Desmond's is in actuality an old film featuring actress Gloria Swanson named Queen Kelly, which prior to its use in this film had never been seen by U.S. audiences due to the fact that it was never completed. Not because of anything so lurid as a murder, but because Swanson herself walked off the project. Scenes in which she believed she was supposedly coming into ownership of a dance hall turned out to be featuring a brothel instead. Two patch jobs exist, one released after the director's death, but neither were completed according to his vision. That director, Eric von Stroheim, who appears in Sunset Boulevard as Desmond's butler, as well as her first husband. I directed all her early films. 
Or put simply, he's essentially playing the man who directed this film, which he in fact did. This is a thinly fictionalized version of himself he's playing, presaging Inland Empire's themes of characters and their actors being blurred into the same person, and going some way towards explaining why that movie's film within a film, which features Polish actors speaking Polish in Poland, for some reason has a German title, as German was the first language of the Austrian-born Stroheim. Everybody getting this so far? Speaking of the Polish-German film, we see Lost Girl bumping into the Phantom on the streets. He remarks on the strangeness of seeing her on the streets instead of in their home before mentioning a murder that has occurred nearby. Initially, she appears to think he's referring to her killing of Smithy's wife, but after he insists he's seen her with this person, her demeanor shifts as she realizes he's referring to someone else. As it turns out, Smithy himself, who probably died at the Phantom's own hands in revenge, his manner even suggests he wants her to know this, and thus so pass the two leads of the original production. But meanwhile, up in the real world, Piotrek has gone to seek out a certain man he expects to find living in some old circus trailers, and is told that the man may have gone to Inland Empire. Inland Empire. This is the name of an actual large region of California east of Los Angeles, known for being a massive shipping and railway hub, which may be why the sounds of trains are ever present in the film, not to mention the song Do the Locomotion. Patrick is accompanied by none other than myself in my handy human disguise. His quest will lead him to a house where three uh, men are performing a seance, attempting to communicate with Lost Girl, whom Patrick can hear but not see, suggesting he does indeed know of the history of this film. She has wanted him to come and has spoken to the mediums of the man he works for. In response, they give him a gun and advise him to hurry as it's after midnight. When he leaves, the men drop their disguises, revealing the rabbit spirits again meddling in the story, which is changing from his past version. I speculate that Beatrix's employer, the man he expected to find at the circus grounds, is the Phantom, and that sometime after midnight is when Lost Girl was killed in the past, likely in this ominous dark tunnel that we see multiple times. Through the alley, behind. The marketplace. After being advised by the movie version of the mystery visitor about the man next door, Crimp is the name. Susan also encounters Crimp, the phantom, who approaches her with a red light bulb in his mouth, which triggers a memory or a premonition, perhaps, something to do with that red light district that's been on her mind. It had something to do with the telling of time. And as Sue goes from sitting in her empty house to sitting outside in the rain, she has a breakthrough as her friends greet her with an almost bemused <laughs> as she realizes she's been living on the street with them this whole time. Her husband didn't leave her after learning the truth. He kicked her out just as the Phantom did to Lost Girl. And like her, Sue has ended up on the streets, forced into prostitution to survive. She sees both a reflection of herself, which she's seen multiple times throughout the film, and a half-seen Doris who is stalking her. She retreats to a nightclub where she knows one of the employees I know Carolina. and proceeds to have the encounter with the rabbit man we've seen unfolding over the course of the film. She tells him her son died, probably in utero after this incident, causing her downward spiral. Just after this revelation, we see that she has the initials LB tattooed on her hand, which I suggest is simply the name of the son that she lost. If anything, we know that his last name would have been Blue. The rabbit man receives a phone call and takes it in an adjoining room, where he repeats a phrase we heard earlier at the seance about a horse in a well, rather similar to something we'd hear much later in Twin Peaks. After hearing him say that Crimp is around somewhere, Crimp? Yeah, he's around here someplace, that's for sure. She flees back into the street, but this time, Doris takes the screwdriver away and uses it against her, in a way a form of payback for their encounter in a previous life. This isn't the way it was. Sue collapses at the corner of Hollywood and Vine amongst some other homeless people, one of whom talks of a friend who pretends to be a star but has fallen on hard times, and now just... Stay her home with her monkey. Yet another allusion to Sunset Boulevard. Sue dies as a homeless woman comforts her with the benediction, No more blue tomorrow. But it's merely the rap on Kingsley's film, a fact which takes a while to sink into Nikki's head as the other actors drop character and leave the set. Like Norma Desmond, she seems to have trouble distinguishing her reality from her role. Why are you still in character? I know, but I don't have to tell you. Days she wanders off when suddenly she reacts to something. She has become aware that Lost Girl is watching her. She enters one of the sound stages where a theater is playing part of the film. Like in a dark theater. Life is still imitating art in real time as Nikki sees images of herself watching the scene, but art has one aspect to it that life doesn't. 
editing. Through cutaways, she sees a new scene of herself discovering something in the dresser drawer in Sue's bedroom and sees where the rabbit man went after he left the office. He went into this very theater at this actual moment. The curse is not yet broken, as Nikki is still trapped in the story, but the man seems to entice her to follow him, which she does. Upstairs, she sees a clock, indicating it is now just after midnight, when her character is meant to die, and crucially, the scene she just saw replayed in the theater was the one in which she heard that Crimp was around somewhere. This turns out to be true. Passing through another Axon indoor, she re-enters the Smithy's house set and finds what she saw herself finding in that assembled film, the gun Piatrek acquired from the rabbit man performing the seance, sitting atop his green coat. Did he leave it intentionally for her to find? It's uncertain, but this sequence of events is rather similar to one which would eventually appear in Twin Peaks The Return, wherein the fireman recruited an agent, gave him a weapon, and arranged for his enemy to arrive in the same location to be taken down. You could view Wee Rabbits as working against the Phantom. As she wanders into a section of the set we've not seen before, she comes across a door numbered 47. The title in German was Fear Sieben, 47. The Phantom approaches her, but now armed with a pistol, she shoots him repeatedly. He caused a reflection. We see that the Phantom was the doppelganger that had been following Sue throughout the film, the curse Kingsley spoke of. That he could appear as other people was already suggested when this woman watching Lost Girl in the streets makes the Phantom's hypnotizing gesture at her. Evil was born and followed the boy. Sue's reflection was, of course, her screen character, a liar and a cheat, which is how the Phantom saw her after his own betrayal at the hands of her former self. And shooting him, she destroys that reflection. You're scared. Scared of who? Scared of you. The finale of Sunset Boulevard gave us one of cinema's most famous quotes. Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Nikki gets her own psychotic close-up and rejects it. She will not be subsumed into a character. She will not become the adulterous Susan Blue and end up in ruin. Actions do have consequences. And in choosing the righteous path, she redeems her old self, who after untold waiting, is now freed from her purgatory and allowed to rejoin those she loved, Smithy and the son she'd lost. Remember, in Lost Girl's variation on the story, this woman was unable to produce children, not Smithy. Again, much like season three of Twin Peaks, we have a story of a character saved after the fact of her death, though in this telling, it seems to be a happy ending for all, oh, crap, somebody's at the door. It wouldn't really do to let her find us here. It would just be too hard to explain, and besides, with the Phantom dead, our job here is finished. Besides, it was all really the old gypsy woman's tale anyway, a tale of what Nikki might become by taking the cursed role. Now Nikki sees a new tomorrow, one not so blue, one of being satisfied with simply being herself. There will be no more blue tomorrows because Susan Blue has been left behind. Unlike Norma Desmond, she's learned that she doesn't need to cling to stardom. The dream she had clung to so desperately had enfolded her. Wow, the insecurity level with you guys is ridiculous.